Hi, I'm Peter Merholtz. Thank you for having me. And I have big thanks for the organizers of UX Days for inviting me to speak to you all. Uh, the title of my talk is The Atomic Unit of Design is the Team. Uh, there you have my contact information along the bottom. Let's get started, shall we? So when I, uh, I used to run a consulting firm <clears throat> and then <clears throat> in 2012, I left that consulting firm and went in house. And at that time, these were the prevailing mindsets in terms of how to think about product teams, tech teams, whatever you want to call them. Either the uh, Amazon two pizza team, right? No team larger than can be fed by two pizzas. And that team is a complete team. It has all the capabilities to, to deliver. Or um, now what has had even greater kind of impact and longevity, the Spotify squad model, where you have small cross-functional teams that are called squads. They roll up into tribes and you have other groups called chapters and guilds that kind of lay over that. Um, and which that model has now taken the world by storm often uh, through the context of the scaled agile framework. And in 2012, uh, these were just getting uh, some traction, particularly in Silicon Valley where I work. And so when I went in house, this is what I saw. I saw um, essentially featured teams uh, where you would have uh, with design product management and engineering and designers would be embedded in those teams, partnered with the product manager and some number of engineers. And in this example, I'm using e-commerce that would happen to be the company that I uh, had joined uh, was Groupon, um, but uh, e-commerce is something that I think everyone can kind of relate to. So you had, you know, a team dedicated to search and browse, a team dedicated to the product page, another team for reviews, etc. And this model uh, has definitely has some advantages for the designer. Um, particularly, they are a member of the team, and because of that, they are there throughout the whole life cycle of development for that product. And because of that, um, they have a real sense of ownership of the work. Um, they feel um, uh, included in all the decision-making of the team. And they are able to, after launch, they're there to do any quick iterations that are necessary. So there's a lot of good reasons for having designers embedded on, in a team. That said, having design embedded within teams, within cross-functional product teams, does lead to some issues over time. Um, designers find themselves working on a narrow problem for a long period of time. You're the designer on that product page. You're going to be moving buy buttons around and making them bigger and changing the color. There's only so much of that you can do. Uh, designers get lonely. They're the only designer in this team. So they don't have any other designers to turn to. Um, their growth opportunities are unclear. They don't know what it looks like to grow because their, their role is kind of defined by being this embedded team member. What does it mean to be something other than that? Uh, designers in this type of context are often situated with more senior people, right? You'll get, I've seen over and over again, kind of junior or mid-level designers working with mid-career and later career product managers. When you have that kind of relationship, the product managers are essentially just telling the designers what to do. Um, by having design embedded in each of those teams, you end up with this siloed user experience. Each team is solving their design problems in isolation of one another. And when you bring it all together, it often doesn't hang together. And that can be a problem for the user who's having to cross the work of each of those teams. And it's a less efficient use of time and people. There, uh, every product team has a certain um, cadence and sometimes they need a lot of design and sometimes they don't need any design, but you always have an embedded designer. So if you need more design than that one person can do, you're kind of stuck. That one person's just going to be working a lot. And if you're in one of your cycles where you know, you're in doing QA or some other kind of production work and you don't need it so much design, well, there's nowhere for that designer to go. They're just sticking around. So they end up polishing pixels, trying to keep busy until they're needed again. The other challenge with this model, by having a single designer in a team, is that it ends up asking a lot of that designer. 
When we think of an embedded designer, we're typically thinking of this kind of product designer that's good at visual design and interaction design. But the reality is it takes a lot more to deliver good design and software. There's copywriting, there's user research, strategic thinking, information architecture, as well as interpersonal skills like communication skills, the ability to plan and structure work, the ability to lead others and bring others along, right? So now we expect this one designer to do all of these things in order to operate in an organization like this. And that's frankly unreasonable. You're not gonna get an individual who's good at everything. So what you're gonna get is someone who's act, who is only okay at everything, or maybe they're good at some stuff and they're not good at other stuff and your product is gonna suffer because of it. Now, this is a model optimized for engineering and haste, right? This is a model uh, designed to um, produce a lot of stuff quickly and to make sure the engineering team, which is a team, right? You usually have six, seven, eight engineers working together. They're working in a team and they've got what they need in order to succeed. But when I, as I so when I came in house and I saw this approach, I asked myself, what if we were to optimize for user experience? What would that look like? Much of my career since leaving consulting has been trying to figure out how to bring the relevant aspects of an environment dedicated solely to quality design into corporate contexts. So for 10 years, I helped lead a UX consulting firm called Adaptive Path. Our clients came to us for one thing, good design. So our whole company was structured around how do we deliver, how do we deliver good design? That was all we cared about. When I went in-house, I saw that those companies are not structured solely to deliver good design. So, so that question is, what can I bring from what I'd learned working in consulting environments that can apply uh, to these in-house contexts? And one of the most obvious things to me uh, is that when you look at any organization that's optimized for design quality, any design firm, any agency, design always happens in teams. You never have a design project with just a solo designer. There's always a group, it might be two or three, it might be six or seven, but it always happens in teams because that's what, what it takes to get the best design. So I thought, why don't we take these embedded designers and pull them out and turn them into a team. Um, now, uh, there's an experience I want to share that uh, somebody else had that I find quite relevant. <clears throat> uh, Director of Design Nicole Burrow wrote about this on uh, a blog, and what she talked about joining a company and the seating arrangement of the product teams when she joined, where you had a designer, a product manager, and engineers just kind of sitting together somewhat willy-nilly. And what she realized is that if she were to rearrange them so that the designers could sit together, they're still members of those other teams, but they're now able to sit together and they're forming this kind of quasi team that can work with each other, help each other, solve problems uh, with one another. Now, the punchline of this is that Nicole Burrow, when she figured this out, she was the director of design at Spotify. Right? So this company that is held up as the um, example of, of Im designers embedded on feature teams um, has themselves had to hack at that in order to get solutions for, for designers to be able to do their best work. So there's a lot of reasons why you should have designers working in teams and that design be located at that level of a team. Make sure that designers don't get overwhelmed with expectations, right? You're not that one designer with all these things that you're expected to deliver on. Um, you're instead working with others who can uh, help deliver across that set of skills. Um, designers, when they're on a team they're, and not embedded within a certain product or feature, they now, they're not stuck on the same thing forever. They get some flexibility in the work that they do. When you have a team of designers working together, you can recognize that designers have strengths and weaknesses, and you can complement them uh, so that you have greatness 
on every skill, just not every designer delivering that greatness. Um, you, uh, for me, perhaps the most important reason for thinking about design as a team, when I was a design leader looking at an e-commerce experience, I was really afraid of that silo, siloed experience that we were getting with these different teams. I want that end-to-end -end experience to hang together. So by pulling the designers out of those silos and having them operate as a single team, that helps me ensure a holistic end-to-end -end experience for the user. Designers uh, will now be, you have this opportunity for designers to be appropriately leveled with their cross-functional peers. So when we pulled the designers and turned them into a team, you have these um, senior designers who are able to work with the product managers uh, directly. So you no longer have junior designers engaging with mid-career product managers. You have senior designers and, and, and senior product managers collaborating with one another, and it's a much more equal relationship. Uh, here are the more junior designers in the back kind of getting to float to where they're needed. And then here is a content strategist, because this is one of the things that you get with it, is you can have folks who aren't designers become part of the team who have uh, an important craft skill that can be brought to bear, whether it's content, whether it's user research, you now have a space for them within that team. Um, by operating in a team, designers can now learn from one another. They're not isolated uh, within a, a feature team. They're now working with other designers. The junior designers can learn from the more senior designers, but vice versa, the senior designers can learn something from these new up-and-comers. Um, so, so there's this just greater ability to, to learn from one another. Um, by operating in a team in this fashion, you can load balance across the different product teams, right? As I said earlier, sometimes a product team needs more design than one designer can offer, and sometimes it doesn't really need any design. And by having it, this team working across, you get um, that ability to move people to where they are needed. Designers aren't getting lonely because they're working within a context of a design team, and they're just more naturally supported in their career, their development, their day-to-day -day growth. So now that I hope I've convinced you that it is better for designers to work in teams instead of in isolation, let's talk about what it takes to shape an effective design team. So I'm going to be discussing four elements of a, a design team. Purpose, people, practice, and potential. We're going to dig into each of those. So what defines a design team? What defines any team is its purpose. A team without a purpose is just a collection of individuals. But a team with a purpose now has a reason for being. That team, there's a reason why it exists. Um, over this past year, I've worked with a number of design teams, helping them articulate their purpose. And I'm going to share a couple with you now. This first one uh, is for a news organization. And the purpose statement that we arrived at for the design team was, the product design team champions all readers through crafting engaging, enriching, and enduring experiences. This is why they exist. A different team that I worked with that uh, was working in a much more technical context um, had the product design team champions human values throughout strategy and development and empowers users by taming technical complexity in designing reliable, safe, and approachable experiences. So each of these purpose statements allow the members of the team to understand what they're about, why, why this team exists, and what it is that they are expected to deliver on. It also helps the design team communicate to the product teams, to engineering teams, other people, just what it is that they are meant to deliver. Once you have a purpose in place, you then must be intentional about the design of your team, the shaping of your team. And it's there we're going to talk about the remaining three aspects, the people, who is on the team, the roles, the skills, how they relate to one another, the practices of the team, both process and methodology, but also rituals and norms. How do things get done? And then the potential of the team. What defines success? 
What are those desired outcomes and impact for the team? So starting with people. Um, a design team, kind of like those two pizza teams, should have between four and seven members. If you get more than seven, you start getting uh, communication and coordination challenges. So you want your design teams to be about four to seven people. You want there to be a strong leader. We're going to talk a lot about team leadership later uh, in this uh, session. Um, so I won't go into detail now, but you're going to have a strong leader. And then you're going to have a set of other designers, senior designers, junior and mid-level designers, maybe a content strategist who bring with them a spread of skills. So underneath each of those uh, icons is a little kind of bar chart. And those bar charts you can imagine are different skills. And it's, it's the same skill. So the first bar is going to be the same skill for each designer. And the second bar is the same skill for each designer. And the idea here is we have this ability to have a spread of skills, right? Uh, across strategy, planning, research, interaction design, information architecture, visual design, writing, prototyping, leadership, such that when you take all of those folks and you combine their bar charts, there's basically no gaps, right? You're, you're delivering on a level of five at every skill except for that uh, looks like that sixth one where you're still delivering on a level of four, right? So you're you're able to deliver greatness because you have someone on the team who is really good at everything. Let me make sure that's clear. Um, not one person on the team who's really good at everything, but by combining the efforts of the whole team, you know who to turn to to get greatness at any skill. Um, and then the last thing to think about when building your teams is to ensure that you have a diversity of experience, some more senior people, some more junior people, different backgrounds, uh, people who went to design school, people who went to maybe got a social science degree like I did in anthropology, um, people who've lived in different parts of the world, whatever it is, and different mindsets, just different ways of approaching problem solving. Some people are going to be more generative. Some people are going to be more analytical. Bringing that all together to create the uh, the, the greater the diversity you have, the more different perspectives you bring to bear on the problems you're solving, and that makes it more powerful. Now, what happens if you get beyond seven team members? Well, you don't want a one super giant team. What you want is a team of teams. So let's say you've got a set of product teams uh, for as your e-commerce experience is growing, so are this, the number of product teams, and you're going to have a team that delivers on this buyer experience that goes across those teams. So let's say you have 18 or so designers, break them up into three teams of four, five, six each that are responsible for different phases of that journey. Discovery design team, purchase design team, post-purchase design team, right? So it's the same shape of a team. They're just focused on a part of the journey as opposed to the whole end-to-end -end journey. So net, once you've gotten the people figured out and organized and brought together, now you need to f help them uh, figure out how to get their job done. So that's when we're going to talk about practice. Now, part of practice, what everyone thinks of when they think of practice and design is process and methodology. And that's important. I'm showing here the double diamond, um, uh, uh, which I actually don't like as a process model. Uh, I've seen too many people treat the double diamond as a rigid step-by-step -step process uh, that design teams or designers should follow. I actually think that's an unhealthy view of it. Um, I much prefer Christina Woodkey's uh, expansion of the design thinking uh, model uh, that she posted that really recognizes just how messy the design process is. Um, and all that goes into it and all the starting and stopping that, that can happen. Um, regardless, you are going to want to have a shared understanding of how you approach your problems through process and methods. But as important and typically overlooked is you're going to want to have, every team needs to have a set of rituals and norms, essentially behaviors for how they show up and how they do their work. So, um, when it comes to thinking about this in the context of a team, there's kind of you can use the life cycle of a team to, to, to map this, right? So every team has a start. At some point, you're going to bring some people together who've probably never worked together before. And too often when this happens, companies just throw people together and expect them to figure it out and don't give them any support and give them expectations that they're going to be delivering right away. 
You need to spend some time allowing a team to establish itself and to embrace certain rituals that allow them to define themselves and allow them to um, share expectations of one another. A ritual we used to have at Adaptive Path uh, at the start of every project is shown here. So that's me uh, when I was much younger. Um, and then my co-author, Kristen Skinner. And at the start of every project at Adaptive Path, because these would often be teams of people who hadn't worked together, uh, we would lay out these cards that had these different attributes or qualities, or personality characteristics. And let's say you had a team of four or five people, which was the case uh, in this instance. Um, those four people would choose the cards that, def that, that defined the qualities they were expecting of that other person. So you didn't choose cards for yourself. Your team chose cards that, that communicated what they wanted of you. So in this case, my team wanted me to be positive, a good listener, strategic, transparent. And the team wanted Kristen to be an advocate, to be organized, to be a delegator, also to be a good listener. So this allows us to have an understanding of what we're expecting from one another, separate from just our um, role on the project as a designer or a program manager or a researcher. Then um, once a team is in flight, there's a set of uh, practices that they're going to embrace and a set of norms that help the team perform better. Uh, I'm only gonna talk about a couple here. Uh, and there are a couple that have gotten quite popular in kind of broader management thinking, but are really relevant for teams. On the left, you have a diagram from uh, Google's Project Rework, where they did some research into what made an effective project team. And Google went into that work with the hypothesis that the most effective teams were the teams with the uh, highest performers, the best performers. You just get a bunch of rock stars together and they're gonna do great work. And it turned out that's not the case. Um, and um, the single biggest predictor of success for, uh, uh, or effectiveness for a, for a project team was this top item here, psychological safety. Psychological safety is that idea that um, anyone on the team feels safe about their behavior within the team. They can speak up, they can disagree even with someone who's senior to them. They can try things and if it doesn't work, that's okay. They can make mistakes and they're not going to be punished for it. That kind of safety that allows people to experiment, explore, speak out, um, leads to, uh, is, the, is the quality that leads to effectiveness, that quality greater than any other quality for a team is psychological safety. On the right-hand side, uh, we have this two by two. Um, and the reason this, I, I, I call this one out is because designers, I've worked with a lot of designers and a lot of different design teams over, over my career. And designers, a lot of the reason we become designers is we have this um, deep-seated empathetic connection with people. And we want to serve them and design is a way of serving them. Um, we bring that empathy to our interactions with our peers. The problem is if we're too empathetic with our peers, uh, we might not call them out when they're not delivering good work. And so uh, this two by two from Kim Scott, you'll see on the upper left-hand corner, this phrase ruinous empathy. That's where we're not willing to criticize a colleague. And instead we say, no, no, that's great. Your work is great, even when it isn't. And what ends up happening is we don't produce good work as a team. Uh, our work suffers because we're not willing to criticize someone. And uh, what Kim Scott argues we need to embrace is what's in the upper right hand corner, radical candor. Um, that's that idea that we can be frank with one another. We can be honest with one another. And we're not going to be, if I receive frank criticism, I'm not going to be offended. I'm not going to be mad. I'm going to take it in the spirit with which it's offered, which is as feedback that helps me and the work be better. So these are the kinds of things, the kinds of norms that we want to encourage our design teams to be embracing as they do their work. Finally, um, Yours, there's a, a set of norms for when the team disbands. Maybe it's not totally disbanding. Maybe a person or a couple people are leaving and you'll be bringing some new people on. Um, but it, that's, that's a time to celebrate as well. And that's a time that uh, 
uh, for a ritual. And in this case, this comes from a former colleague of mine who is now the VP of uh, product design at Zendesk, Kim Lennox. She used to work at LinkedIn and they have this thing called hashtag next play. If you go onto LinkedIn and in the search box type hashtag next play, you'll see a number of posts, mostly from people at LinkedIn about leaving the company. And LinkedIn celebrates this. They want, they want to uh, shine a light on your departure and the new opportunity that you are embracing, right? And so having these rituals, having these norms of behavior within a team um, is crucial to uh, its success and its, its effectiveness and the smooth operating of a team. So the last P that I wanna talk about is potential. Uh, specifically measures of success. And uh, there's a couple of types uh, I'll be referring to here. Uh, the first you'll see are business value. So uh, long ago, I attended a talk by Satyam Katam Neni, and he was a design leader who went back to business school, or went back to school, got an MBA uh, to under, better understand business and realized, and this is what he was saying in this talk that he gave, he realized that, this, that the things that business people care about are the things that designers have an impact on. Adoption, retention, customer satisfaction, engagement, uh, efficiency. These are all things that the business wants to deliver, and these are all things that designers can improve. And so his point was, we can tie our work <laughs> to business value, and we should. We should be holding ourselves accountable uh, as designers to the business. Other measures of success that are more internal to a design team or a design organization are what I have labeled here functional health. So what is the quality of the output of the design team? Is the design team putting out good work or mediocre work? Um, how satisfied are employees? What is that employee experience? Do employees have high morale or low morale? Are, are people leaving? Um, uh, uh, just how engaged are people in their work? And then the last one is around effectiveness and velocity. How productive is the team? How effective are they? Are they able to work at a pace that you would expect a, des a healthy design team to operate at? Um, last year, as I was helping these uh, various companies with these charter building exercises, I helped many uh, design teams figure out measures of success for themselves. And I just want to share some or share one with you that I created so you have a sense of what I'm talking about. This was for a product design team, so not for a whole team. And um, we identified these four big areas, team health. Uh, so that's that kind of team morale, employee morale, organizational integration and influence. So this was a design team that felt like they weren't getting involved in the planning processes uh, to the degree to which they expected. So we set as a goal for them that they would they would contribute to things like roadmap planning, um, delivering quality experiences, right? So how do we make sure we're not just delivering mediocrity, but that we're de delivering good stuff? Um, and then design system. So every design team, it seems, is building a design system and the measure of success for any design system is adoption. Uh, uh, it's, it, are teams using this design system to solve their problems? If so, then it's serving its purpose. So we had um, a metric aligned with that. And then on the right-hand side, we had this kind of one-off metric for the year. Um, these were designers who were working largely in isolation, embedded on product teams, not getting to work with other designers. And so we set as a measure of success um, their ability to collaborate with other designers. Uh, and that was something we were going to, uh, uh, that this team was going to really aim for uh, in, in how it structured projects. So we've now talked about the, these four Ps, purpose, people, practice, and potential. And I like to turn them into this little kind of icon um, because it allows me to talk about them in the context of all the teams that are a part of any design organization. It's not just one design organization, right? So before, when we showed that team of teams, we had this buyer experience design team, and they would want to have their purpose, people, practices, and potential identified, but so would all those sub-teams. And maybe you're in a marketplace model, so there's a whole other 
design team, um, which has its own sub teams. And then there's this leadership team, right? You're gonna have a VP of design and some design directors and other leaders, and they're a team and they need to have this identified. And then you'll maybe have a functional team like the UX researchers that are embedded in these teams um, are, are a team themselves and they'll need to figure out what is the purpose of UX research? Who are the people that we're going to have to de deliver on that? What are our practices and uh, rituals and what is our potential? So um, uh, it, it operates at every level of a team. You want to have it defined. Um, if your team is smaller, you might not have to spend as much time figuring it out, but it's still crucial to make it explicit. So um, the next thing that I'm going to dig into when it comes to thinking about the design of a design team is what I believe to be the most important role in your organization, um, which is that of the team lead. Typically, when we look at a org chart of a design team, we think that the most important roles are the most senior ones, a head of design, design directors, maybe a creative director, a director of research. We look to those folks and say they must be, because they're the most senior, they're the most important roles. What I would argue is that the most important roles are for the team leads who lead the, who lead the actual work of design with some set of product designers, content strategists, user researchers uh, 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 delivering the, the work. Um, and I'm gonna share why I think this role is so important. Uh, to start with, team leadership operates at a scope and scale uh, unique to that role that spans um, quite a range, right? Uh, uh, a team lead needs to be able to go from strategic thinking, right? What is the understanding the, the company and its goals and directions, and then turning that into an uh, understanding of strategy. How is the work of my team going to connect to the company's goals? And then interpreting that strategy through the structural design work and the surface work that their team is now delivering on. And that team lead needs to be able to span all those layers of uh, scale and complexity. Each of their team members is gonna be kind of responsible for some part of that. And you wanna make sure your team has coverage across that, but none of them has quite the breadth that the team lead does, right? So that team lead, I'm not saying that the team lead needs to be able to execute in a detailed way at all these levels, but they need to be able to uh, review, guide, direct across all those, all those layers of scale. Additionally, the team leadership is at the hub of a set of crucial relationships. So I have a model for design leaders based on the set of archetypes, and the team lead has to embrace three of these archetypes. They have to be able to manage down, be this coach that gets the most out of their team, right? They create a context that allows the team to be the best team it can be. They provide a vision for success for that team, direct them where they're heading and, and help them understand what success looks like. Um, because the people that the team lead engages with are the ones doing the detailed design delivery, this is where quality is um, delivered. And, and this is where, this is where, as we say in America, I don't know if you have the same phrase in the, uh, in France, but this is where the rubber meets the road, right? This is where quality is going to be, um, uh, finally delivered on. And so the team lead is responsible for maintaining that level of, an acceptable level of quality for the work that their team is delivering. And then this coach uh, needs to recognize that the, uh, the people on their team are people, not just resources, and work with them as individuals to help get the most out of them, that they're not just interchangeable parts, but they're individuals that need to be engaged with uh, separately. Uh, the team lead and the other and the next archetype that the team lead must embrace is one of the diplomat. And that's the ability to manage across working with product managers, engineers, marketers, other functions in the organization. And to be a successful diplomat usually requires balancing some competing forces, competing pressures. One pressure is to be a strong team player, right? You want to be easy. You want to just link arms and be a good team player and recognize that product people and engineers 
um, that you're all in this together with them, even when they're doing stuff that you don't like, right? Uh, too often design leaders can adopt victim stances. The product manager didn't give me enough time or didn't give my team enough time to do good work. Or, you know, we're not giving the, we're not, we don't have the resources we need to do the, to do good work or whatever it is. I, I've seen often that design leaders can feel like they're a victim of forces beyond their control. You'll never get anywhere with that uh, approach. A design leader needs to um, figure out how to work with product managers and engineers um, so that they can all together accomplish a common goal. Recognize however much those other people might be pissing you off, they're also doing their best. They have a set of pressures on them that they're trying to manage as well. That said, you can't, just because you're a team player, doesn't mean you're a pushover, right? Diplomacy doesn't just mean doing whatever the other person says. You have a stake in it too. And so you do need to stand strong for your ideals. You have to have principles. You have to understand your purpose. You have to know that there's a certain level of quality that you will not budge on and make sure that that is understood um, uh, by your peers, right? And so there's this balance of working with and occasionally compromising and accommodating in order to get along with your peers, but knowing when to stand firm um, for, for what is important when it comes to design. The last archetype is uh, uh, managing up, being a champion, um, in particular in the face of executives and other stakeholders and the input that they're going to be giving you. And this managing up uh, is sometimes referred to as being the shit umbrella, or I think I, uh, as I read, a parapluie de merde, um, right? There's all this stuff coming at your team from executives. Um, you, they're not giving you enough time or they're trying to um, uh, take your resources to work on something else or they're giving you unhelpful feedback. They're cr criticizing the work in ways that doesn't uh, make sense. They're doing uh, what is sometimes called the executive swoop and poop where a CEO shows up for a review says it's terrible, and then you never see them again. It was the first time you've seen them in the process, and then you never seen them again, and you don't know quite what to do about that. It's the responsibility for the team lead to shield their team from this onslaught and make sure that the team is remaining focused on what's important and what matters. The last thing I'm going to talk about in terms of the importance of the team lead is coherence at scale. So earlier I showed this group of product teams um, building up this buyer experience and how you needed a set of teams now in order to deliver that holistic end-to-end -end experience. Whereas before you could do it with one team of five or six, now you're doing it across three teams. So how do you maintain that coherence? Again, that's still important. It, it was important when we were one team. It's as if not more important now that we're three teams. And the way to do it is for those team leads to ensure that the work that their teams are doing is laddering up to this coherence of the overarching user experience. So it's a lot uh, that we're asking for these design leaders, the managing relationships, delivering, uh, ensuring quality, delivering coherence. But it needs, we, this is the role uh, that has uh, more impact on all those aspects than any other. And so we need to um, recognize the importance of this role, support this role, enable this role, um, be very particular about who you put in this role. You can't just put anyone in a role like this, given the amount of responsibility and influence that they can have. Um, but we also shouldn't put someone in this role and just abandon them. They do need our organizational support. Um, but this role is the, is the key to success in your team, particularly as it grows. The last thing I want to talk about is how design teams can enable uh, some untapped opportunities. So at the start of the talk, we, we talked about these decentralized and embedded models, uh, the Spotify squad models, where you have designers working with product people and engineers and in these small uh, feature teams. And then we said, you know what, let's pull them out of that and we create a single design team that works across that set of feature teams. And, in the book that Kristen Skinner and I wrote, we call this model the centralized partnership because while design is centralized, it reports up through a single design leader, 
the teams are in explicit partnership with uh, different parts of the business. So in this case, we have a team here dedicated to the buyer experience and is in partnership with those product teams. We might have another team dedicated to the seller experience and they'd be in committed partnership with product teams who build those seller tools. Um, but, and I'm gonna take a little detour and it'll come back around. Um, it's important to understand the evolution of any product category, any technical category. Um, so let's look at the evolution of, of uh, uh, wireless communication, right? Uh, uh, wireless internet communication, right? So many years ago, you had the Nokia communicator, the first mobile device that allowed you to get on the internet. And, you know, it worked fine, probably not great, but it didn't almost didn't matter how well it worked, just that it worked at all was what was interesting, uh, that you could use a mobile device anywhere you were and get on the internet. And that phase in this in the development of this technology is what we're calling the technology phase, where it's just about that capability, just about the technology. At some point though, uh, as more and more products come out delivering within this space, uh, the products start competing on features, right? And companies, the way that they uh, try to attract customers is by cramming more and more features and better and better features into their product. So in the case of smartphones, you maybe had faster connections, more memory, um, cameras that had more megapixels, um, more apps. But often what happens when you go into this feature fight is that these products get overwhelming. They get very hard to use because they're, they're doing so much uh, that they become really difficult to navigate and they're just not good. They're not good products anymore. Yes, they solve the problems, but they're, they're, they're almost overwhelming. We use them because we feel like we have to, not because we want to. And then the last category of this kind of product development is experience, right? Where it's no longer about the features and it's more about the experience that this product delivers to the person using it, right? So when the iPhone came out, from a feature standpoint, it actually didn't measure up to other smartphones. The camera wasn't as good, it wasn't as fast, it didn't have a keyboard, which was considered a problem by some, at least at the time. But as we now know, what, 14 years later, this is the model that won. This experience redefined the category. So what, why am I talking about that? Well, let's think about this approach with even what I'm proposing in terms of teaming design. These teams are still stuck in a features world. They're still mapped onto a set of teams that are delivering on features. But if I think about the last consulting project I did at Adaptive Path was an e-commerce site. We had a team of five, so actually not even as big as this. And not only did the team that I was working on work on designs for search and product page and reviews and checkout, but we also built out an entire shopping experience around, that included gifting and merchandising, sharing and social uh, wish lists, the ability to pick up in store and a style guide to build it all, right? And so what I'm uh, arguing here is that is that if we optimize for design teams, we get way more than just building a set of features. We can now structure these these amazing coherent experiences. And what I'll leave you with is this idea that with an intentional team capable across a spread of skills guided by a strong leader, design can not only deliver its best work, it can become a force to be reckoned with throughout its organization. And with that, I thank you. And I guess we're now going to move over to live Q&A.